These are conventional 3D printers placed inside not very conventional 3D printer. It's huge as everything here in this lab. Unfortunately, this old machine is slow and unreliable, but using well-known techniques of milling, shaking, bending, drilling and destroying, I will make this 3D printer great again. I mean fast again and reliable again. And of course, we will test its performance later in the video. So let's get started and hope you enjoy. You probably know me as the world's most famous engineer, right? Famous for my creativity in product design, like here. Right? The machine I'm going to upgrade was so slow that even tiny Benji took days to print. After using it as an entertainment box for years, it is time to change it. Most of the issues of this printer are related to the heated chamber and the insulation around it. Accordion protection was meant to keep the hot air inside of the printer and still allow mechanics to move, but it jams the motion and causes step loss. Stepper motor of the Y-axis was installed on the moving beam and was too big. Only four extruders were installed on the print head, tons of wiring and other stuff made motion system very heavy. The plan is to remove the accordion protection and to expand the heated chamber to the hole. Some of the walls will require additional heat insulation, but most of them are already prepared for heat. Motion system will be completely rebuilt with the Core XY kinematics. Y-axis beam will be replaced with 20x20 20 20 aluminum profile with a single rail guideway connected on the side. All of the holes were drilled and tapped using my CNC machine. Rail is placed parallel to the beam and all of the screws are tightened to the required torque. On the both ends of the beam, two slots were machined to adjust the mounting plates. Two pulleys on each side will guide the timing belt around the Y-axis. I install beam for the first time in the printer to check if it fits and if nothing blocks the motion. Some people say nozzle design is very important. I wasn't one of them until I lost them all. I have a bunch of old super volcano hot ends. It would be a mistake not to waste time trying to improve them. I don't like to make mistakes. So that's exactly what I did. I want to reach 90 degrees C in the heated chamber, so everything inside must be heat resistant. Having this in mind, I decided to fabricate only three parts of metal and leave the rest for later. I will regret this decision someday, but now let's focus on fabricating the main plate of the print head. This 3mm thick aluminum alloy plate will hold all components of the print head and will be attached to the Y-axis carriage. Making chamfers is definitely one of the most satisfying parts of the machining except of ducking from the broken cutters flying into your head. I decided to spot drill the marks for the holes and drill them later manually. Having this result, it is time to go to the drill press. Setting up all of these different drills in a milling machine for a single part would be a waste of time, so it is much faster to do it manually. Tapping threads where is necessary is the last step for this component. Multiple ends of the timing belt attached to the print head using special clamp. 2 mm belt tooth step requires machining 1 mm wide slot. So that is 1 mm diameter mill. And this is my milling machine. It was created to destroy metal, not to make teeny tiny parts. So will this tiny mill survive or not? You will know after a short music break. It is a perfect time to subscribe to this channel. You were also expecting this, or was it just me? This block of aluminum is a water-cooled cold end, which I machined off the camera. Most of these nozzles are broken and have a painful history, but the rest of them will have it in the future. You see the length of this super volcano nozzle. 
and now you will see the time it takes to replace that nozzle. I am not in the hurry, are you? I am switching from 1mm nozzle to 0.4 to have the same setup as the desktop printers, so I can properly compare the print quality. With the old nozzle comes old and not efficient cold break, but it has to be thick as it's the only one support for the long nozzle. Let's just not worry about the length of the wires for now, it is totally fine. Almost. I am casually swapping the temperature sensor as if nothing happens. Four countersunk screws will hold the carriage behind the plate. Heat insulation goes on top, leaving the space for the Allen keys on the sides. It is meant to prevent the heat transfer from the cold end to the print head. Assembled extruder goes on top and it is locked in place via two screws from behind. Screws are replaced for a longer one to install a thread extenders, which will hold a separate PCB board for the CAN bus communication with the print head. Cooling radiator is placed on top of the stepper driver. Well, well, well. Is that a 3D printed part inside of the high temperature environment? Holding a critical components such as cooling fans and the probe? That's not good. With mechanical assembly being complete, let's move to wiring. Connecting heater wires to the board, which were long enough apparently. Cutting power cables and CAN communication for the eddy probe. Shortening the temperature control wires and crimping the ends for the different connector types. Connecting probe power cable, only fans, or I mean cooling fans, extruder stepper, and CAN bus for eddy probe. Tool head wiring is complete for now, wires will be placed properly later or never. Total weight of the head is around 355 grams. Working with the T-slot aluminum profile is very convenient, as you can put threaded holes wherever you want. This plate will support the cable chain for the X-axis and will allow me to lock the ends of the chain. The second half of the plate will just lock the air path from the heated chamber. I need to measure the length of the chain and decide how many links should I remove. This is another approach of creating threaded holes, not as fast, but still convenient. By locking the end of the chain, it is done for the x-axis. After perfect cinematic transition, we install the beam again. I connected the chain to the beam, beam to the rails, beam to the chain, and I feel like a connector. 12 meters of timing belt and 10 pulleys links the motion system together. This design allows me to place stepper motors outside of the heated chamber, so that no additional cooling is required. I use 10 mm wide timing belt with steel strands, so cutting it is the kind of the battle. Round 1. Fight! One circle is done, so we can lock it to the print head and adjust the tension later by moving the corresponding stepper motor. The second circle of the timing belt is mirrored to the first one and driven by another stepper. Why would you ever put aluminum bar there? Feeding the timing belt through all of the pulleys and locking it to the print head brings us to cutting the end. Round 2. Fight! After having an obvious winner, we can lock the last end of the timing belt to the print head. After timing belt being tensioned, let's check if nothing wraps the belt. Oh, there is! These wires will need some additional support. I install the side wall, which will close the heated chamber and leave the steppers outside. This is the wiring we are going to install, plus this. No, 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 that was before. This time everything is simpler. Water lines, filament tube, power wires and data cables. It is easier to start with the biggest tubes and then continue with the smaller. That wasn't easy, as though silicon tubes create some decent friction. I decided to feed the communications through the beam to save some weight on the cable chain. After realizing how easy it was to fit the Teflon tube through the chain, I decided to do it again 
but now with the wires connected to it. I connected a filament tube to the extruder and pulled some extra wires out of the printer. I'm not sure if it helps, but I like to slide things around. Those fittings will connect the cooling lines to the cold end of the extruder. You never know when the end comes, but here comes another end for this tube. But if the tube is round, isn't it endless? Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, this piece of tube will help me to decrease the diameter from 12 to 6 mm pipe, so I can fit everything through the cable chain. For now, I am using standard water cooling setup for personal computer, and cooling fan stays always on. I might add some more sophisticated cooling controller, but there is nothing to cool. I mean, printer is cool, but it's not too cool to cool, right? So cooling liquid is added to cool a very cool printer. I am adding more and more liquid as it's being pumped through the system. And the most important thing in this stage is to look for any possible leaks. Somewhere around half a liter of liquid was in the pipes. And now I will try to get rid of the extra air which is stuck in the top of the radiator. Having a fire extinguisher nearby, I am feeding the electricity to the printer. Let me check something real quick. Ah. Not that easy! I am too greedy to throw away a working hardware which is so old that is barely useful. I will better spend 3 weeks trying to figure out how to flash different boards with the different firmwares and trying to make them communicate and all of that mixed with the wrong wiring and two identical boards one of them was brand new and you thought you already flashed it 10 times because LED was on, there was a lot of struggle. I will walk you through some key steps in case it is useful or maybe it will help me to get rid of my pain. So the Raspberry Pi is constantly running Clipper, which has very convenient web user interface. Most of the parameters can be changed online without the need to reflash the firmware. I've chosen an existing printer profile online and started to adjust it. Homing is definitely one of the most important steps. You choose the stepper direction, switch location and you are good to go, right? Have I shown you how to machine a new Y-beam because the previous one was bent? A good rule of thumb, calibrate your eddy probe before you attempt to do a first Z-homing. It might save you some time. Bed that they have is quite large, so it is supported with the four ball screws on the corners, and each of them is driven by a separate stepper motor. And when the power is off, some of the corners might move down due to gravity. To make sure bed is parallel to the printing plane, there is a specific calibration called Z-tilt, which measures the height of the each corner and makes the adjustments to the ball screws. Since my bed is 1.5 meter by 1, traditional bed scanning methods would be too slow. That's why I have chosen an inductive sensor, which can do a rapid scanning of the bed surface. To make the printer move fast, it is important to measure the resonant frequencies on each axis, so that clipper can suppress them and make corners sharp and flat surfaces without waves. You can see the results of an x-axis, where the peak is at 30 Hz. Y-axis vibration test was not as good. There are more peaks and more powerful algorithms should be used. Is that a first print or what? But I would rather consider it as another calibration. During this test we calibrate the flow rate of the filament. Test samples with the different flow rate settings are printed and you choose one which has the most smooth surface. The test can be repeated with the finer parameter step, so you will get a finer tune. In a large-scale 3D printers, the rate of deposing the filament is critical and that's what needs to be improved in order to decrease the overall print time. During the next test, flow rate will be increasing each layer. Then you measure height when the print fails and can simply calculate your maximum flow rate of extruder. You can see the speed of the bed scanning. For this test, I've switched to 1mm nozzle, as it's the same I'm planning to use later. Have you ever doubted a need of drying a filament? Don't. Those bubbles are not good, you are not supposed to have them. The test was slightly boring in the beginning, so I went to check the flow rate. 56 cubic millimeters per second, nice! When I come back there was no extrusion, so I instantly increased the current for the extruder stepper. This time I was able to save the print. Just look how fast filament disappears. 
After getting a warning of stepper driver overheating, I decided to stop the print at 72 cubic millimeters per second. These are results of my test to find what's the weakest point of the extrusion system. I will tell you conclusions of my adventure in a minute, but for now, the first official print. The next steps would be adding a water cooling block on the PCB on the tool head so I can run a higher current on the extruder, testing newer high performance nozzles, installing closed loop motors and hybrid Core XY kinematics, and closing the heated chamber and printing some larger parts. Thank you for watching and see you in the next videos.